sorry for my voice, but I have never, never seen anything like it. I mean, do you believe in miracles? Yes! Hey, welcome back, guys. It's Television Tuesday. We're breaking down Amazon Prime's new show, Hunters, which I binged over the weekend because it's that good. Before we jump too deep into it, I want to say thank you to everybody who continues to listen. Thank you to everybody who continues to send the content to everybody. If you haven't checked out our baseball content yet, that's up on the podcast page. You can go check that out. Uh, Also, just off the jump, I need to remind everybody, we're on Apple Podcasts, Spotify, Stitcher, YouTube, we're everywhere that you want this podcast to be. We're there for you guys. So feel free to send the links to everybody. There's no excuse for your friends not to listen to the podcast. All right, that's out of the way. We can get into the show. So the show comes out on Friday afternoon. There's only a certain group of people that I know who were saying, okay, we got to binge this show from start to finish. There's two groups. There's the people that really like Al Pacino. Because there's Al Pacino super fans all over the world. And there's people who ingest this pop culture, ingest this media to do podcasts like this. I broke this entire show down. There's 10 episodes. All the episodes are right around an hour 10-ish long. So they're not. They're, it's not a show that I don't think you're supposed to binge. It gave me big House of Cards vibes uh, early on. With the just the, kind of the twists that every episode had, every episode had. But I'll say this: in an era of bingeable shows, an era of Netflix, Amazon Prime, HBO, even, will kind of put out shows that are very digestible. That you will you'll watch it and you'll say, "Okay, I'm ready to go on to the next one." Avenue Five has been like that for me, where. I'm ready. Or I'm halfway through this episode. I'm ready to get on to the next one. This show is not like that. This show is very distinct in that way. The same way that House of Cards was, you'd have to, when it came out, you'd have to watch it in one weekend, but you knew it was going to be a complete weekend. That this is going to be a Saturday and Sunday thing. This isn't just going to be a 10 hour, let me sit on the couch and watch this on Saturday. It's heavy content. So IMDB breaks this show down as a diverse band of Nazi hunters living in the 1977 New York City discover hundreds of high-ranking Nazi officials who are conspiring to create a fourth Reich in the U.S. The electric team will set out on a bloody quest to bring them to justice. That description doesn't do it justice to me. This is a show that has a lot of different levels to it. If you haven't seen it yet, I highly recommend that you watch it within the next week or two and come back to this podcast so that we can like talk, you can listen, you can digest the content a little bit better. If you are thinking about getting into it and you're not really sure, that's what we're going to do here. I'm going to give you a little bit of what you should expect, and then we're going to get into the show and what I liked and what I didn't like from it. Reasons you should get into this show, because I highly recommend it. It's got four out of five stars, I think, right now on IMDb. Uh, Seven seven out of ten is the official score. I would give it probably an eight or nine out of ten, eight and a half out of ten. I don't understand how anybody could watch this show and not really enjoy it. So it starts off following our hero, the hero of the show. You might remember him from, uh, he was in the Percy Jackson series. He played Percy Jackson. It's uh, Logan Learman. Learman. Uh, Yeah, Logan Learman, who he plays Jonah in this show. Jonah starts off kind of being the, I, I don't want to call it a cliche, cause, but it kind of is. It's like the really attractive guy who's still kind of a nerd and gets bullied. That When we get these guys get bullied in these TV shows, we never get anybody that's actually going to get bullied. We always get somebody that's a little bit too hot to get bullied, I think. He's a little bit too hot to get bullied. Uh, we start off with him living with his grandmother. His grandmother ends up getting killed, and it forces him to meet up with Meyer Offerman, played by... None other than Al Al Pacino. So he forces him to meet up with this group. He quickly learns the plot that is developing, that there are Nazis kind of living among us, and what does that have to do with him and how his heritage being a Jewish American in the 1970s, it's 30 years after the war. So all of these guys that they're going to go after are 
kind of geriatrics, to be completely honest with you. There's no strapping young men who are Nazis that they're going to go out and kill. It's a very, it's a very interesting concept. It kind of goes directly off of the other Amazon Prime show they have is The High Castle, which if you haven't checked that one out, I kind of I recommend you watch that one as well. I think it kind of tails off for me after season two. But that was a good show too. I made a joke while watching this to one of my roommates who blew it off completely. I told him, I was like, it kind of feels like Amazon will do every show imaginable to slip swastikas in it. Because High Castle, ton of swastikas. And the concept of that show, if you don't know, is it's the if the Nazis would have won World War II and how Japan and uh, Nazi Germany kind of split the world in half and how now these two opposing sides are going to fight each other. But again, that show, ton of swastikas. This show, ton of swastikas. So if you're into that type of stuff, if you're into that historical fiction, the revisionist history, Amazon Prime is really buying up that corner of the market of the revisionist history or the this is cool historical fiction type stuff. I'm almost surprised at this point that Jeff Bezos hasn't called Bill O'Reilly and had him come on as a showrunner or come on as like a show creator on the Amazon Prime streaming site at this point because that's just how much, in my opinion, historical content that they continue to put out. So the merry band of Nazi hunters, they go out, they hunt Nazis for the entire time. There's twists and turns. That's pretty much what I'm going to give you for those of you that haven't checked out the show yet. That if this is a show that interests you, please, like I said, go watch it, come back to it. For those of you that have seen the show already, for those of you that are like me, watch the entire entirety of this show this weekend, let's talk about the things that we really liked. I came in very hesitant with Al Pacino playing a Jewish American. I came very hesitant coming into that because I didn't love the concept of that guy uh, taking that role. Like, I get it. You need to have some name recognition for the show. I get it. You need to have some name recognition for the show. I get it that you need to be able to sell the show to Amazon. You say, hey, uh, Al Pacino's on board. Okay, that's going to get us probably greenlit a lot quicker than if you have, say, you know, Jerry Seinfeld involved, right? Especially with a show like this. But I want to give Al Pacino some credit. It's two-part credit. One, he was by far and away the best in The Irishman. And if you want to go back and listen to that movie review, it's out. But him playing Jimmy Hoffa, he did a very good job of playing a historical character. He comes in this one playing Myers Offerman, the head honcho, the guy that is kind of running this Nazi hunter group, and blows it out of the water. Like I said, I came in very hesitant with him kind of coming in and playing this role, but he did a very good job of it. Another thing I really liked, outside of Al Pacino, and of course, uh, Logan Lerman does an incredible job in his role of Jonah, but the other thing that I really liked about this show is that it goes, the flashbacks, and it's really hard, in my opinion, to get that right. The flashbacks in a show like this one that you're flashing back and you're kind of telling two concurrent stories. And not only are you telling two concurrent stories, you've got all of the other characters in the show as well who are, you know, trying to... We're, we're trying to build their uh, background too. So you look at Murray and Mindy uh, Malkowitz. We need to get their side of the Holocaust too. We need to get their survivor story too and how their kid dies. And that was a very big, I think, plot point, too, that was just – they did a really good job of telling that story. It is incredibly difficult to do the flashbacks, to make it compelling. But when I say that I sat on my couch for six hours on Saturday and about four hours on Sunday, I mean it. I was invested in the show. Now, granted, I tried to do some other things while you know watching the show. I tried to get a little bit of the uh, baseball research that I was doing for the other podcast. I was trying to do that, get that done out of the way, but I couldn't. I was just so fixated on the show. Another character I really liked was uh, Josh Rador's character. He remember from playing Ted in How I Met Your Mother, Lonnie Flash. Now, when Lonnie Flash comes into 
the show. When he is introduced into the show, you immediately think, oh, this is just some goofball, right? Like, the rest of these guys feel like special ops, or they've got some sort of, like, killer edge. They live through the Holocaust, so they know what it's like to kill. They've been around death before, so they know what it's like. This guy is in his 40s, maybe, a movie star. It's just like, where does he fit in with this group? And to see his progression go from just kind of the goofball character to a guy who the rest of the team kind of makes fun of early on in the show. They make fun of his drug addiction where he was talking about how he was on cocaine at one point and how his movie career wasn't all that great and wasn't all that special. To go from that to pretty much being the hero of the climactic scene where they're going to go blow up the factory with the corn syrup. This is a character arc that I completely, I stand. I love it. And the thing is too, about Lonnie Flash's character is that I was really worried when we were looking at the show, of course they were going to keep, uh, uh, Jonah alive. They're going to keep Jonah alive because they're going to make a season two. Amazon prime does not make Amazon doesn't make shows to have them fall apart, right? Like Miss Maisel, they've kept on the air for a while. They're going to keep this show on the air for a while. They're, they're going to continue to make content. And if they can get something like this to work, they're going to love it. I I will say that I was really worried that his character was going to die off. There was a very touch-and-go scene that all of us remember where he fakes having the bomb. There's another scene where he ends up getting uh, stabbed. I think all of us thought a bunch of times in the show that he was going to be the character that gets killed off. So his ability, uh, the, not Josh's ability in the show to play Lonnie Flash so well, after, if we're being completely honest, I don't think any of us really loved How I Met Your Mother, how that show ended. So for him to come into this show, and hopefully, we can only hope that season two is even better than season one. And we're going to get into season two and what I expect at the very end of this podcast. So stick around for that. But the the fact that he had such an important role in the character arc. I really like that. Of course, we got to talk about Greg Austin as well. A guy who I had no idea who he was coming into the show, but he was able to play Travis Leitch, or Leitch uh, the new Nazi, the guy with the mud chops. Very easily distinguishable. His ability to in, just take that character to that next level. Right, the scene where he's with the German Nazi in the car, getting his, filling up the gas, and the other guy, kind of privileged, you can kind of see the privilege on his face. He thinks that he's better than everybody else. The fact that, you know, Travis is in the car with him, and tells him, "Look, everything you guys did, you're you guys are a failure. I don't know why you think what you did in Germany is going to work here." When Americans do everything better. And I just, that scene was very powerful to me. And then, of course, there's all the different scenes where he, uh, the scene where he kills his Jewish lawyer in the prison to command respect from the other prisoners. That was a very interesting scene, too. He's, he's got this weird deal where it gives me, it gives me big Hannibal Lecter vibes, it gives me big Anthony Hopkins, young Anthony Hopkins vibes. This would not shock me. Is if they're going to do a Silence of the Lambs like spinoff, they're going to re kickstart that franchise. If that's something that's going to be in the works in the next couple of years, it would not shock me in any way if Greg Austin is the guy that they pick in for that role because he just gives me these like serial killer vibes. And he did such an excellent job in this show, too. Like, there's so many characters in the show where you come in and you really, I, I think a lot of people only really were there for Al Pacino. I, I like the concept of the Nazi hunters, so I was I was in on that. But Al Pacino, of course, was a big deal. Having all these other great actors, though, that kind of stepped up, even if it is guys like uh, this next guy we're going to talk about in a second, Dylan Baker. Even if it's like guys like Dylan Baker, who you know you recognize his face from other shows, you recognize his face from other projects. But you have a bunch of guys who, outside of Josh Rander and uh, uh, Logan Lerman, outside of those two, not a ton of these guys have had, in, in my opinion, very big, prominent roles on big screen or on these movies and TV shows. 
so to have all these kind of B characters, all these sidekicks come together, I really like those type of projects where a bunch of sidekicks, a bunch of kind of spare pieces from other shows come together and they make an excellent show. Those are the type of shows that I really, really, really like, and this is one of them. Let's talk about Dylan Baker, though, because he plays Biff, the Carter administration kind of the, – the guy that is influencing the Carter administration, influencing them to take some of these sanctions off of South American countries. Of course, with the audience knowing that these South American countries have, A, a big uh, dealings with – the neo-Nazis in America, but B, a lot of these South American countries have neo-Nazis in them. So you take up some of these sanctions, those guys can make a little bit more money. Biff ends up going back to the USSR, which I thought was very interesting for season two, but he is a guy that it felt like he would... It, there's good parts about all these shows, right? Like all This felt like... And I was going to wait till the very end of this podcast to give it this rating, but it, it felt like one of those shows that is too good for cable television, like Breaking Bad was, that Mad Men was for AMC. That you're watching it every week and you're thinking, like, this show probably should be on pay per view. This show probably should be on a better network, just for the production value and just the storytelling. You don't think that it would be on a, sh- a, on a cable show. This show feels like it should be on HBO. It's missing the production value, clearly. But it's got great story writing, and it's got a great cast. It felt like this show deserved to be on Showtime, deserved to be in the same lineup with Succession, deserved to be in the same lineup with Billions, and shows of that caliber. So you get a guy like uh, Dylan Baker coming in, playing Biff. He felt like he was coming straight off of uh, Fargo. It felt like this was the character who continues to end up getting – you know, tripped up and befuddled, and that it added a comedic sense to it, especially when you look at the source material for this is very rough. Okay. <laughs> a lot of, you know, Holocaust remembrance, a lot of reminding people how tough the 1930s and 40s were for, you know, Jews living in Germany, going to Auschwitz. That's a, where a lot of the flashbacks occur. So there was a lot of times for me, I'm sitting on my couch and I'm biting my bottom lip because it's just so sad. I cry during Sarah McLaughlin, like puppy commercials. So when we have a show like this, that there's people dying left and right and there's all these different sad stories going around and it's these flashbacks to a really tough time, it really draws a lot of emotion out of me. So let's talk about the plot twist. So again, if you haven't watched the show, this is be the time to turn it off. The Al Pacino plot twist, very interesting to me. Very interesting that they had this – they built him up as a character. This is one of the best plot twists that I can remember in modern television. Just the fact that he goes – Meyer goes from being the Bruce Wayne type, the guy that's financing all these Nazi hunters. He's financing all of the investigation. He is the lead guy to go find all these Nazis. He's going and doing all this. For him to turn out to be the wolf – is just a 180, just a head spinner. And to have Jonah kill him, this is where we're going to get into the season two stuff. Because clearly the biggest teaser was Adolf Hitler in Argentina, that we see the white mustache and the white hair. You hear the name Adolf. That's clearly the biggest plot twist. That's clearly the biggest teaser. That's clearly the thing that we're going to be waiting for for season two. That, that's a no-brainer. But the fact that Al Pacino dies in the show, very smart by David Wells and the showrunners over there because you don't love to have a guy like Al Pacino. And I'm not trying to jinx it. you know. I'm not trying to put any ill will out there. I'm not speaking it into existence. But it's not smart if your franchise hinges on guys that are over the age of 65. It's just not a smart idea. You don't want the Star Wars franchise to do it. You don't want the Indiana Jones franchise to do it. You sure as hell don't want a new television streaming show on Amazon Prime to do it. So getting rid of Al Pacino early on in the show, or early on in this hopefully show's long run, makes a little sense. You get the audience in, you tell a good story, you're going to keep the audience for season two, whether Pacino's here or not. But the twist of him being the wolf, and the way that Jonah figured it out, the way that he doesn't, Meyer doesn't do the prayer over who we think is the 
Wolf ends up just being a Nazi surgeon. So one less Nazi in the world, who's going to complain? But the fact that he doesn't do the prayer over him is the thing that clicks it off, the thing that tips Jonah off, which just goes to show you that he is really the heir to this Nazi hunt. He's really the guy who is going to be leading this hunt in the future, which I really like that too. Like I said, the storytelling of the show, where we go from a nerdy kid in New York who gets bullied out of selling his weed, whose grandmother gets murdered in cold blood and he doesn't do anything, to have that origin to now being the guy who is at the... He had uh, Travis, the American neo-Nazi, he had him dead to right if the FBI agent doesn't come in and stop him. And now I think that's going to be the big story going forward. Is It's going to be these two clashing over and over and over again. And hopefully we can get a fight scene or a fight or conflict between these two every season now until the show stops. All right Now until the showrunners say, hey, that's enough. Hopefully we can get one episode every single season where these two meet up and face off. Because that would be the, that would be the most excellent thing, I think. I think that's the best way to keep the show going and keep me interested at least. But he kills the wolf and you got to think to yourself, okay, what is this going to do to the group? And I like that the group didn't fall apart. I like that the group kind of regained, they came back together. We know that uh, the nun and we know that uh, Lenny Flash, they're both going to go and go across the pond. They're going to go to Eastern Europe and go hunt some, or, uh, hunt some Nazis. Pretty excited for that. I think that's going to be a really good kind of twist to the show. But, again, it's this the Argentina deal with Adolf. What do you do with that if you're the showrunners? Because now this is where – and this is where it gets tricky. Because you got me for season one. It was all centrally located in New York City. There wasn't a whole lot of crazy stuff happening outside of – uh, Biff going to D.C. and getting the sanctions lifted on some of the South, uh, South American countries. Outside of that, it pretty much all was contained in New York City. Now you're going to have this group of people. There's going to be some in New York with the FBI agent and the neo, the American neo-Nazi. Those, both those guys being in New York. Now you're going to have uh, Jonah and his group go to Eastern Europe. You got the group in Argentina. This is where it gets tricky if you're telling a story. Is how do you get all of these different things happening in these different areas of the world and keep them connected enough that you can tell a story? They did an excellent job with this season, keeping everything going, but I'd be worried in the future. That's my one big worry is that they're going to stretch themselves too thin. They're not going to be able to tell as a unique story uh, going forward. But this show, I gave it five out of five stars. I give it all its praise in the world. I think that if you haven't seen the show yet, if you know somebody who hasn't seen the show yet and you've watched it, they're they're missing out. This show, is it going to win an Emmy? I don't know. I don't know if it's in that quality of drama, but I think that it's going to get nominated for sure. I would not be shocked if I saw Al Pacino get nominated for an Emmy. And it's going to be a very interesting uh, television season. So... That's going to do it for Television Tuesday. Tomorrow we have uh, Sam OJ's NFL Big Board. We broke down the AFC South, arguably the most competitive division in football. All those teams are very similar. So we broke down his mock draft, his big board for them. That's a lot of fun. Thursday we have Alexander Haynes coming on to talk to us about Super Tuesday, which is happening today. If you haven't gone out and voted yet, and you're in a voting uh, area, if you're primary state, go out and do that. Uh, we're going over Super Tuesday, breaking down the coronavirus, another update on that. And, of course, something's always happening across the world, on the other side of the world in China. So we'll get all of that information. And, then of course, Film Friday, we, we break down uh, Downhill with Julia Louis, Louis Dreyfus, Julia Louis-Dreyfus and Will Ferrell. And then, of course, Gambling uh, baseball on Friday too. So jam packed week. Also, I should probably plug this now before I forget. We have the LSU podcast with Josh booty. That's going to be coming out in a couple days. So be on the lookout for that on the social media platforms. And I'm going to be on another podcast on Thursday, 
It's called the San Mo Show. It's by a guy named Cleveland. I think that's a very interesting name. I'm going to come on his podcast. We're going to talk about the last four years of being Texas State Sports Prez going on to being the Sports Prez. We're probably going to talk about this podcast too. So thank you so much for listening. I will talk to you guys again tomorrow.